Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today we're going to present the 1984 film produced and made in Martinique in the French Caribbean, Sugarcane Alley. This is an extraordinary film, indeed now one of the classics of all Caribbean cinema and based upon an equally famous novel. We'll be talking about how it portrays the coming of age of a young man, the conditions of colonial Caribbean, and the way in which it visually represents the society that it takes as its subject. Joining us today on City Cinema Tech will be the distinguished Caribbean novelist, Marise Condé. Now, take this pleasure to see the beautiful coming-of-age story, Sugarcane Alley. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see what is one of the classics of Caribbean cinema and I think is a film that ranks with any film uh, in the world in its portrayal of the coming of age of a young person who's trying to come to grips with exactly what kind of society he's growing up in and how he's going to respond to that society. There's a lot to talk about in this extraordinarily rich film and I for one don't think I could have a better guest today than uh, the distinguished Caribbean novelist, uh, Marise Condé. Uh, a number of our viewers will know her uh, from her many works, which have been translated into English, which include such novels as I, Tituba, Black Witch of Salem, Crossing the Mangrove. Uh, there's also a, a wonderful set of interviews with, with Marise, conversations with Marise Condé, which has been um, published. And that work gives us uh, much background, Marise, on uh, your life, your childhood uh, in the French-speaking Caribbean, on Guadeloupe, where you grew up. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what this book meant to you as a young woman reading and thinking about the Caribbean. Okay, I suppose that if you, if you have a look at uh, my last novel, which is on, not a novel, by the way, it is much a story about my childhood. Oh. If you look, if you read it, you will see uh, one of the chapters devoted to Joseph Zubel. The influence of the novel, when I read it for the first time, I was about 14, and how it seems to me that it changed my life and my approach to uh, Caribbean society. I was born in a, what we can call a middle class family, so I never knew about the real poverty of the West Indies, about the way some people have to work and die in the sugarcane fields. So I read that novel and I discovered uh, an aspect of a Caribbean society that I never knew. And for me, it was, it was discovering the true face of my country because I had the feeling immediately that people like me, born in middle class uh, uh, societies, were not the true, authentic, if we can say, authentic uh, children of the Caribbean. So it was really a kind of eye opener. And uh, from that, it seems to me, I, start, uh, I started getting involved in a kind of political uh, fight for Guadeloupe. Well, and it's interesting, had you already been writing as a child at that point? Uh, and did this novel have any effect upon uh, your eventual uh, growth or decision uh, to be a writer? No, I've been writing, you know, uh, you write for your mother, for your father, your sisters, and so on. But I had never decided that I was going to become a writer. So at the time, it was mere, uh, merely a kind of discovery of the society, knowledge right. of the society, but not so much an influence on any particular uh, career that I was going to undertake. Right. Well, th one of the things our viewers may not um, know about your work is that while you're a major contributor to Caribbean literature yourself, uh, you're also a major scholar of Caribbean uh, literature. So uh, talk to us a little bit about before we actually get to the film itself, it's very important, I think, for us to know something more about Zobel, this novelist, and um, the place of the novel in the development of a 
French-speaking Caribbean literature or, or a Caribbean literature as a whole? You know, at the time uh, when Zubel started writing, we had only one celebrated poet, Aimé Césaire. And of course, it was about uh, intellectual, philosophical, ideological problems. But we had, before Zubel, we never had somebody writing about everyday life, about the, the life of a normal, of a poor Caribbean woman and a poor Caribbean child. So it was, in fact, the emergence of a new genre that you can compare to the roman paysan of the people of Haiti. Now, we are not interested in the people living in the cities. We are interested in the people living in the countries, the way they suffer, how they manage to make a living, how they can hope for a better future. So it was really the beginning of a kind of commitment right. in literature. And so uh, now, if we compare Zobel to uh, writers now from Martinique or Guadeloupe, uh, they have lost that kind of uh, interest in the working classes. They talk a lot about themselves, <laughs> about people like them, about uh, people uh, visiting France, living in the USA, myself, I do the same. But you know, that kind of basic commitment to the people who live in there and die in Martinique and Guadeloupe, it is only uh, Zobel who really sort of initiated that. Well, one of the things uh, I'm particularly impressed about uh, the, the novel, but also about the, the film and this tradition, is, is in a strange way, I've got to say, it's quantitative. That is, there's a way in which there are simply millions of people in the world who live under a set of conditions, who make a life, who sometimes suffer a terrible life, but also sometimes create noble lives in any number of, uh, of ways, who, uh, because they are not coming initially from so-called literate societies, those who are literate take perhaps less interest in them or do not have that much experience of it, or it's very rare, as this film and novel dramatize, that passage from uh, a primarily agrarian and oral culture into a print culture uh, which is organized around modern, modern industry. Uh, so it's really extraordinary to, in a certain sense, just get this slice, to get um, uh, realism has a bad name among a lot of people until you get something that is marvelous, not that it claims to be marvelous, but it's marvelous because it simply shows you a segment of the world that somehow one may even know existed or suspected existed, but concretizes that world, gives it a life in a particular way. And I think it's not so difficult for, for me as a North American to uh, transfer this story to uh, certain of the conditions in certain areas of the United States or elsewhere in, say, Latin America or in yeah. colonial societies throughout the Pacific Basin. Uh, all of these things, I think, reverberate uh, in, uh, in the film. It seems to me that it is, uh, it is a story uh, showing you that in some societies, the only way uh, out of poverty, out of disease, out of humiliation, is education. But at the same time, there is a kind of idea that education is a kind of double-edged weapon yes. thing. If you, if you get education, you are uh, uh, separated from your people. You leave your people behind and you go uh, another way. So I mean, by trying to get education at the same time, in spite of, of yourself, you are a kind of traitor to your people. So it seems to me that that kind of ambiguity is clearly portrayed in the novel and in the movie. Uh, just to give certain evidence of what I uh, uh, agree with you about, for example, there are two children chosen for the scholarship yeah. examinations. And one of the children, the, the young woman, is not allowed to go because her father, as the father explains to the teacher, she, mm -hmm. he says, well, you know, I have other children to care for. And she has been secured a post, the post mistress. Mm -hmm. uh, the postal service is promising her something. So that's a, a perfect example of the way in which the family economics and tradition 
regulate, doubtless in part because she's a woman as well, uh, that she's moved just far enough into literate society so that she may get a form of civil service job. And that's enough. And that yeah. she won't be a traitor, she won't threaten the community, she won't be fully separated from the family in doing so. And of course, because our protagonist is the only child and is cared for by his grandmother, those ish, and the, mother, the grandmother has a clear vision of what this can do. Though, when she gets to Fort de France, the, the, we see her, in a certain sense, both proud of her grandson, but in another sense, having to come to terms with an urban society that is part of the promise. But it's not a part of the promise that she particularly likes. Yeah, but you know, we, we have to see that Joseph was a boy. And uh, as we said, the girl who got the scholarship uh, at the same time was a girl. Yes. So there is a kind of machismo in a Caribbean society. A girl was not expected to reach the same standard of uh, education and living yes. as a boy. So it is only now that women are fighting, women are, are trying to compete with men. But for a long time in, Caribbean, in the Caribbean societies, there was a place for women, for girls, and they had to stay at home behind the, their, uh, I don't know how you call that, something you call, behind their cookers, their pots and pans. Right, right, right. They have, a woman's place is in the it's kitchen. in the kitchen. As, <laughs> as, as, it, as it were. Um, well, let's talk about uh, some of these officials in the film, because the degree to which uh, there's a whole structure of teachers and civil servants, I think this is a very interesting uh, mirror of these contradictions of, of uh, Martinique uh, between, uh, between, the, between the war. Uh, yeah, but you know, the first character who is very important is the schoolmistress, yeah. because she's the one who is going to give, to set a kind of image uh, for Joseph. The poor boy is hungry, coming to class almost uh, with the belly empty, and there she sits and she takes her breakfast, and there is quite a ceremony about that, which is extremely well depicted uh, when she drinks the milk, she breaks the bread, and so on. And the other character, which is very important, is the gérer on the uh, habitation. He has got a son, but uh, you know, he, n there is no question of being a father, a real father to the son. Right. There's a kind of descent, because at the time, everybody has a place. So, uh, Carmen society was a kind of hierarchy. Yes. The white man, the mulatto, and deep uh, below, of course, the black man, the descendant of the slave. So it is a kind of picture of that hierarchy and how, after all, it is going to change because José uh, Black right. is going to become a, a kind of uh, middle class intellectual. So there is a kind of portrayal, but at the same time, we see that the future is going to be different. Well, indeed, and there are certain ways in which in the film that is very clearly marked, I mean, by, uh, Two things, apart from what he says, okay, because he, he does mm -hmm. make comment in the film about that. But one thing is the uh, physical movement in the film. We really begin in a child's world, mm -hmm. uh, not even that much touched by the work in the cane fields themselves. It's the time of vacation. The children have nothing to do, but they are, in a certain sense, happy in this their own little enclosed world. And the film's structure is the movement from that world to a larger and larger world. Where, which is difficult, oh. harsher, which is harsher. But you know, it seems to me that there is a difference between the novel uh, written by a man and the movie uh, made by a, by a girl. Right. You see, there's a kind of, a, it is less uh, bitter less aggressive uh, when it is uh, the movie by Eusanne Palsy. It seems to me that maybe uh, Joseph Zubel was more f uh, conscious of, the, of the, the condition of the society. And that already for Eusanne, it is a dream right. about a past which is forever over, which is finished. 
So it makes a difference in the tone yes. of uh, the two uh, pieces of, uh, of work. Well, th that's one of the things that interests me about the film is that uh, many of these materials that you see are most frequently treated in terms of tone in a kind of very direct social commentary uh -huh. and denunci denunciation. Whereas one of the things that for me is a virtue of the film is that the degree to which there is a lyric experience inside of this. Now that's not to deny no. the, uh, anything not, of, yeah. of, the social, of the social injustice or the, the contra contradictions, but still that people manage to create out of their experience and their lives these moments of joy, these moments of interest, and that she captures uh, very well. There's a way in which um, uh, the protagonist has to be, has to learn uh -huh. to be dissatisfied. I mean, he, he learns it increasingly, uh -huh. and he, 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 by the end of, of the film, he's even able to, to judge certain things like the people of Fort de France who do not, who are, um, you know, either silly in their ambitions or uh, if not silly, uh, have a kind of self-hatred uh -huh. about themselves. And by the end of the film, he's beginning to be able to not only see and judge this, but to even argue about this with certain people in a, in a tentative way. Whereas at the beginning, you know, we, we, we see him in this group of children, and it's not just a social, social denunciation yeah. at all. But you know, uh, Uzan wrote the novel, uh, read the novel when she was about Ten or twelve, and she dreamt about uh, shooting oh. a movie for I don't know twenty years. Right. So the movie in her mind became a kind of a, uh, image of the past. She was very fond of. It was a kind of dream. There was a dreamy quality about it. And when she decided to make a movie out of it, the the harsh uh, shape of realities were, had disappeared. It had become a, an object of a, of a desire. Right. Right. No, no, no. I think that, uh, that, uh, that itself, what you've just said, is a bit double-edged. Because for those who uh, know something of the conditions, it's perhaps, uh, for some of them, it's refreshing to see it not treated simply as Wait. social indictment. Yet for people who know nothing, of certain aspects of the conditions, it's true that you may not really understand those harsh realities yeah. from this film. You will under, understand some some terrible aspects of society, but but the but uh, for example, uh, we have the one scene uh, in which the children are out and are working in the mm -hmm. fields. But the but the really the true horror of being an agricultural worker. Uh, mm -hmm. Is, is something that the film, um, since it wants to underline the humanity of the workers uh, and stay away from, but you, you, you may not know how terrible it that is to cut, to, 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 to cut sugarcane yeah. all day long. Uh, not something that, that uh, one really wants to do. And certainly the grandmother says that and wants to save him, but the film doesn't really demonstrate it. Yeah. Um, and you know, there is a character of Monsieur Medouze, uh, uh, in fact, in, in the book, you are, in the novel, you are moved because Mr. Medu dies in the field and they are looking for him and uh, they find him totally destroyed in f by the kings. In the novel, it is so beautiful when everybody is looking for him, yeah. you know, holding some... Uh, the lamps. Uh, yeah. yeah, and some torch and so on through the night. And there is a kind of beauty about that. But it seems to me that it is normal, after all, because the images of a movie had, they have to impress you. They have to, you have to feel uh, lyrical about it more than uh, maybe uh, driven to consideration about social realities. Well, that was actually uh, earlier. I'd said there, there are two ways in which the film, apart from his commentary. Uh, shows us these changes that are ongoing. And this is a world that is, that is going to be lost in certain mm -hmm. ways. And one of them was, of course, this movement from the cane fields to Fort de France. The city. Another one is the deaths of yeah. people uh, in, in, yeah. in, in this. And uh, the death of Meduse and eventually the death of... Uh, Martin. Yes. But you know, uh, 
people would not compare uh, the novel and the movie because after all they don't read the, the novel, but there is a very important change. Okay, please uh, tell us about it. Yeah, because in fact, uh, in the novel, it is the hands of a mountain that Dobel describes. There is beautiful pictures about the, the hands of that poor old Negress woman who had really killed herself in the field. And in the movie, you see only the feet. Oh. You know, Eusanne goes to the feet, and it is the feet of uh, Martin that uh, Joseph washes at the end. So I would like to ask uh, Eusanne, Unfortunately, she's not around. <laughs> Why is that kind of transition? She's invited to come on the show anytime. <laughs> and you two can talk, no problem. Yes. <laughs> we could ask her why the shift to the from the hand to the feet. Is there? Is it more symbolical for her? What is the meaning behind it? I don't know exactly, and I couldn't explain. But remember, one of the last image of the movie when Joseph yes. is washing the feet of his grandmother. It is not uh, as it is in the novel. Well, for, for me, I must say the reason that image works in, in the film is because of the journey structure, mm -hmm. uh, that, that this is the grandmother who has really never been anywhere else but is one of the great last acts of her life yeah. will make this journey. She will, uh, as, as even her grandson you know, jokes with her, you really want to go back to, you mm -hmm. want to see your shack don't you? And she, of course, in that denying that that's what she wants, but in fact, she's really grounded in that, in that place. And it's an extraordinary act on her part mm -hmm. to come with him to reinvent herself uh, from the bottom of the society, from the, from the bottom of the society in which mm -hmm. they have no place to stay. And mm -hmm. it's by chance that someone tells them of, of a, a, a deserted uh, a, a deserted place, and that's. Uh, and I think, uh, for me, in the film, he's washing the feet uh, as a kind of homage to the journey to the that journey jour she made. Uh, to yeah. the journey she's made. She made um, anyway, it is a very sort of movie Im image, but the one in the novel is different. I just wanted to stress upon the difference between right. the two uh, final acts right. of devotion to Martin. Right. Well, the other thing that, that, that bring the that comes up with uh, Martin and with Meduse is this whole question of the way in which the blacks living on the island are positioned between two cultures. Between Meduse has memories of Africa mm. or of knowing Africans. Yeah. Uh, and with him uh, and the death of his generation is the death of that sense of direct con uh, uh, contact. And at the same time, we have the death of that direct contact. You have uh, uh, Joseph uh, being propelled into the metropolitan oh. European um, uh, culture. And a lot of the movie is about living between those two cultures, between those two spaces. How? But it seems to be that uh, it is still the same in the Caribbean. Of course, Africa is becoming uh, further and further behind. But anyway, there is always a choice of life. Uh, are we Africans? We are not. Are we Europeans? We are certainly not. So we are between, somewhere between. And how can we define that yeah. kind of medium position to be black, to be colored, but at the same time, not to be uh, from Africa, to be living in a world where the values, so many of them are uh, imported from New York, from France, it is a kind of dilemma that we are still facing and that we are still trying to solve. Well, this is an issue that, that, that uh, comes up when one talks about uh, the kind of language that is used either in uh, literature of the Caribbean, in the French Caribbean, or uh, the kind of language that's used, that's used in the film. Because uh, my notion is that when we are in Sugar Cane Alley itself, those characters would not in life be speaking French. They would be speaking Creole. Yeah. And uh, this is, it's thematicized in the film, the struggle over what language you speak. But uh, tell us a little bit about that issue. And you see, it is a very big issue. Uh, people normally say that French is just a colonial language 
and that Creole is the mother tongue because it was born in the plantation system from uh, the African syntax, uh, vocabulary uh, French, but syntax uh, African. So it is a kind of composite language. Right. So some people want to uh, see that as a kind of mother tongue, but is it the mother tongue for everybody? A child born in the city, in a middle class family, that, does he or she speak Creole from the beginning? Of course, uh, in Sugukenale, um, we are in a rural society, so in fact, everybody speaks a Creole. But some people, uh, the school teacher, right. the gérer d'habitation, all those people don't speak Creole, even when they live in the country. So it, there is a kind of ambiguity, and it seems to me that it is good that the movie is trying to give us both aspects, people speak Creole, people speak French at the same time, and there is a kind of uh, go between those two languages, which is in fact what happens in the Caribbean. No, no I think that's a very, well, a, a, an important issue, certainly for the Caribbean, but it's another one of those ways in which the issues of the Caribbean can inform debates going on in North America today mm -hmm. about issues of language, correct language versus other languages, second yeah. languages, composites, uh, composite languages. We just have about a minute or so left, Maurice. So uh, why don't, if you wouldn't mind, how do you see this film uh, in relationship to other Caribbean uh, cinema? Why, why is, is it an important film for you and, and why? And that's where we're going to have to end. Yes, it is important, but we must see that it uh, relates, it reflects an epoch, a period of time which is entirely gone. There is nothing now in Martinique or Guadeloupe or very little things which is reminiscent of that uh, age. Now we are facing new difficulties, new problems which are not so easily described. You know, the question is not to be black and poor, the question could be uh, what it is to be a Caribbean whatever is the color of the skin. Okay, um, I hope we're going to have some more cinema from the Caribbean that will allow me to bring you back to talk about those, those things. Sure. If you'd like more information about this show, please drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinema Tech, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Let me give you that information again. Drop us a line to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Marise, I can't tell you what it's a pleasure it has been to have you here, bringing your knowledge as a novelist, a memoirist, a critic, and uh, someone who has seen the Caribbean through much of your own life. Please, it will be a pleasure to always have you back here on City Cinematheque. Thank you. Great. And I hope you join us once again on City Cinematheque, and I hope you've taken pleasure and interest in what we've been chatting about today. Thanks for joining us.